Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Pastor Scott here. Uh, when I'm recording this, it is Saturday morning, uh, June 5th, uh, just before uh, noon, actually. And I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you're able to enjoy the sunshine and the heat today. If you enjoy that, I know some people don't, but some people do. It's going to be very, very warm over the next few days, uh, as I'm sure that you're aware by looking at weather forecasts. But that's not the purpose of this video. The purpose of this video is to uh, continue on our study for the Adult Sunday School video series that will last through the summer until we get back to meeting in person for Sunday School uh, in the fall. And this series is studying Graham Goldsworthy's book, uh, According to Plan, which is a whole Bible biblical theology, uh, where we uh, have been looking at the whole Bible storyline from, from the very beginning to the end. And so the first section of the book um, really dealt with the need for a proper approach and why we, uh, in, in coming to the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> allergies are still dealing with me a little bit, uh, but um, but why we need a proper approach in coming to the Bible um, and why we need to have kind of a gospel-centered, gospel-focused approach when we come to the Bible. And then the second section of the book, which we've been dealing with the last few weeks uh, in uh, several chapters, is really dealing with the, the actual storyline of Scripture. And we saw a few weeks ago how Jesus being the first and the last means uh, that we start with him, not necessarily with creation. And the reason why we do that is not because Jesus is uh, explicitly on the first page of the Bible, but because the Bible tells us that since he is the firstborn, since he is the word of God, since he is the, uh, the one through whom all things were made, that he precedes creation. So we need to put him chronologically really before uh, creation. And we can't think of things, you know, apart from him, uh, such that he is one with God the Father and is God himself, therefore... Anytime we're starting with God, as the Bible does start with God, we are talking about Jesus. So that's why we start with Jesus. Then we dealt with creation by the Word. Then we dealt with the fall. And uh, this week in chapter 11, we're dealing with God's beginning to reveal what redemption is going to be like in the end and how he's going to bring about this uh, redemption according to his perfect plan. And let me say, the first thing I want to say is this. I don't think Goldsworthy talks about this as much, although he might. Um, he... It's not as though the plan to redeem the creation was a plan B. It's not as though Adam and Eve were plan A and then Jesus was a plan B. How could that possibly be the case if Christ is himself the second member of the Trinity, the word who eternally proceeds from the Father and from whom uh, with the Father, the Holy Spirit, uh, spirates, to use uh, kind of the language of philosophical theology, uh, how could he be a plan B? He's not a plan B. He's plan A, actually. And that means that the fall happened uh, with intent. It's not that God brought about the fall. It's not that God caused the people to sin. It's not that God put the temptation there in the garden so that they would be tempted, so that they would sin. Uh, but rather in ways that perhaps we don't quite understand, uh, but we need to accept because the Bible seems to suggest it. Um, the Bible indeed teaches it, the fall happened so that redemption would happen, so that God would be praised for his grace. That's something that's elevated all through the New Testament, is the grace of God being uh, exalted, uh, praised through the work of redemption in the gospel. And he begins revealing that redemption is coming uh, right after the fall uh, happens. I think that before we talk about Noah and then even Abraham, you can see that there is a, a hint of redemption in Genesis 3 when God says that the uh, seed of the woman is going to crush uh, the seed of the uh, serpent. He's going to crush the serpent's head. That's an illustration, not an illustration, but that's a, that's a prophecy, a promise of the redemption uh, that is going to happen. But I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit. First thing we want to note here is that uh, sin's effect, when sin comes into the world, is that relationships and indeed all of creation are now broken and they have lost their uh, original innocence and they will no longer be what they were originally created to be. So creation has a brokenness to it and relationships uh, especially are broken. So man and woman, they're, they're separated from each other. They don't have the same kind of fellowship that they used to. Uh, man and God, same thing. Uh, the relationships are broken. The creation is subjected to futility, as Romans says. Um, there, it bears thorns and thistles, as we talked about last week, and all seems lost. But as you as you read Genesis four and on, it becomes clear that God is preserving a line of people. He's preserving a line uh, 
uh, of people from Adam and Eve on down. And without this line being preserved, all indeed, uh, all indeed would be lost. Uh, it indeed would be lost. And so in Genesis 4, Abel is the righteous son. He's a godly son. Cain is the unrighteous, ungodly son. And what happens? Cain murders Abel. Um, eventually, by the end of chapter 4, um, instead of Adam and Eve saying that Cain must now be the son who's going to carry on our lineage, he drops out of the story uh, because it seems like he's the one who, it seems like he's no longer looked at as a true son of Adam and Eve. Um, and so this idea of this idea of seed who will crush the uh, head of the serpent uh, seems to be very important. And it was going to go through Abel, but Cain murdered him. And now it doesn't transfer to Cain. Rather, Cain is swept aside because God judges him for what he's done. And so Adam and Eve are going to have another son, Seth. And the one who's paying attention uh, to the story would would probably have to infer, as I think we, we, we would have to infer, that the reason why they're so excited with Seth's, uh, with Seth's birth is because they assume that it's through him that this promise of seed that will bring redemption uh, is, uh, is going to come about. So, uh, in 425 of Genesis, Adam knew his wife again. That means they slept together. She bore a son, called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So Seth sounds like the Hebrew for he appointed. Again, just notice that Cain does not replace Abel. Cain is swept aside. Now there's got to be another son to replace Abel, Abel, and there is, and his name is Seth. And so to Seth also a son was born. He called his name Enosh, and at that time people began to call uh, upon the name of the Lord. It's, it, perhaps it's the case that they're um, looking for a redeemer uh, at this point uh, from the birth of Seth and on. But the point is this. Eventually, eventually this is going to lead to Noah and his family. And by the way, um, when Noah is born many, many generations later, his dad, uh, Lamech, um, who has him, he calls him Noah um, because he because Noah sounds like the word for a re, a rest or relief in Hebrew because he says, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. So relief from our work, painful toil of our hands, those are all effects of the fall, uh, the curse on creation that God brings about because of Adam's um, sin. Bear with me here. Sorry, I need a Kleenex because we're running nose yet again. And um, so, so it seems like Lamech is here saying, whereas Adam and Eve had seen Seth really as the one who would bring about this uh, promise, uh, the one through whom God's going to bring about his promise, I should say, of redemption, Lamech assumes that Noah is going to be the one who's going to do this. He's going to be a savior-like figure. And in all of this, hopefully what you see is that in all of this, uh, God is committed to his creation. Um, he, he loves his creation. He cares about his creation. Um, I think that this is even seen in the fact that he casts Adam and Eve out of the garden so that they can't eat any more, so they can't eat from the, uh, the tree of life. Because if they are fallen and they eat from the tree of life, they're going to perpetuate death for all of eternity. And God, as an act of protection for them and the creation, casts them out so that they can't do that. Uh, so actually, his casting humanity out of the Garden of Eden was an act of grace. Um, and so we can talk about, you know, how we're separated from God and all of that. But we're only separated from God uh, until Jesus comes into the world who can then bring us back to God. Um, and I know that this is kind of a, maybe a different way of looking at it, that the uh, casting out of Adam and Eve from the Garden is an act of grace. But I think that we indeed should look at it like that and as a hint of the redemption that's going to come later on. Well, um... Noah, excuse me, and I apologize for this yet again, but uh, but just runny nose, pollen, that time of year, you know. Um, Noah, it tells us, once we get into Genesis 6, everything is just terrible. Um, there's this kind of mysterious little uh, look at these uh, these men called the Nephilim. Um, it seems like they're, they're, they're maybe angelic type figures. They come down, they begin to sleep with the, with women. Uh, it seems like maybe they come from heaven. We're not really sure. Uh, a lot of the Jewish um, sort of uh, uh, material dealing with what that means is a little unclear. Christian stuff is unclear too. It's pretty mysterious, but the point is that things are, are really bad by the time you get to Genesis 6, so that in verse 5, God, God says, 
that he, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's an incredible, incredible indictment that every intention of the thought of his heart uh, is evil continually. And by the way, um, after the flood happens, after the flood, um, he almost repeats that in chapter 8, verse 21, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, um, uh, that is to say, after the, uh, the flood dissipates, the water dissipates and all of that, or evaporates, I should say, uh, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because a man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. So it's the same. It's the same as it was pre-flood, only now, whereas before the flood there were many, many more people, after the flood now it's just Noah and his family, but the evil is still the exact same. So the point is, what I'm trying to say, is when we talk about the doctrine of total depravity, or original sin, uh, we, uh, we mean to do justice to what God says about humanity. Things are terrible if, if we're just looking at the uh, state of fallen man's uh, heart. But in the midst of this, um, in Genesis 6, uh, God says, I'm sorry that I've made them. Sorry that I've made man. I'm going to blot out man. But it says, Noah found favor, verse 8, in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now that word for favor, it actually is the word for grace. It could be translated simply that God liked Noah. Noah found liking in the eyes of the Lord. And so the effect of that is in verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And a lot of people will see verse 9 as chronologically before verse 8. It's because he's righteous that he finds grace in the eyes of the Lord, but the nature of grace is that it's undeserved, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not deserved. If he were righteous, and that's the reason God gave him grace, it would, it would then be deserved. But it seems like Genesis, I believe written by, uh, written by Moses, uh, it seems like it's purposeful in telling us that he found grace or favor in the eyes of the Lord, and because of that, he was righteous. God gave him grace uh, to, to be a righteous man in the midst of an evil generation. And that's really what happens anytime anybody belongs to Jesus, is that he gives us grace uh, to shine his lights in the world. It becomes clear uh, as the story continues on that grace is what preserves people, uh, that it's not people's own works or not people's efforts toward righteousness in and of themselves, but it's actually God uh, who does this. I think that one hint of this, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, would be found in uh, 1 Kings. Oh, let me find it here. It actually might be 2 Kings that I'm thinking about. Um, Elijah, after he defeats the prophets of Baal, uh, he flees Jezebel, and then uh, God speaks to Elijah when Elijah thinks that he's all alone. He's the only godly person in the land. Um, it, God says, this is uh, 1 Kings 19, 18, I, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So Elijah, you're not alone. There are 700 people who will be left. These are people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And we read that and we think that, okay, God's responding to the righteousness of 700 people by saying that he's not going to wipe them out. But that's not how Paul interprets this in the New Testament. In Romans 11, in Romans 11 right toward the beginning of the chapter, um, he quotes that when Elijah is saying in verse 3, uh, back in First Kings, in verse 3, uh, Paul's talking about Elijah saying to God, Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, I alone am left, and they seek my life. God's reply is, I, I have kept for myself the 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. If that was all that Paul said, we would say, oh yeah, it must be that they haven't bowed the knee to Baal, and that's why God's protected them. But look in the next verse, in verse 5 of Romans 11. So too, at the present time, there's a remnant chosen by grace. So what that tells us, uh, what that tells us, since it's a remnant chosen by grace, it's telling us that the reason why they didn't bow the knee to Baal is because God protected them from doing that. It's not that God gave grace because they were righteous. If that were the case, grace would not be grace. You know, it would be deserved. But the reason they were righteous is because God preserved them. Throughout the scriptures, grace precedes righteousness. In a fallen world, Unless there's grace, everybody's going to be unrighteous. Nobody's going to be walking with God, but grace precedes righteousness. So at the in the same way, that's the way that it is with Noah as well. 
That's why the story sounds the way that it does, that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, verse 8 of Genesis 6, and no, in verse 9, Noah was a righteous man, blameless, and he walked with God. Uh, it's very clear, it's very purposeful how it comes about. Um, so I just want you to see that, that, uh, you know, I know that's kind of hard to get our minds around, but if we think that righteousness in and of ourselves leads to gracious response from God, we're not understanding grace and we're not understanding how the Bible treats uh, the relationship between grace and righteousness. Um, and we're not understanding especially what happens within Noah. In any event, uh, later on in the chapter, in verse 18, God says, I'll establish my covenant with you. This first time that covenant comes up uh, in the story, you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. That's verse 18 of Genesis 6. Uh, I am not of the opinion uh, that there is a so-called covenant of redemption pre-time, as in kind of more traditional Reformed theology, um, because I don't think that there needed to be a covenant between the Father and the Son. A covenant is what's established between sides that maybe perhaps don't trust each other. Um, and, uh, I mean, they're like, uh, so God's making covenant with people because he doesn't trust them. Um, and they, as fallen people, don't trust the Lord. But between the Father and the Son, they perfectly trust each other because they are so aligned with one another. They don't need to make a covenant of redemption. There's an eternal plan, but I don't think any, I don't think the eternal plan is the same as an eternal covenant. Furthermore, I don't think there's a covenant of works uh, in Genesis uh, two in the Garden of Eden that then gets broken in Genesis three because I just don't see that in the Scripture. Um, I don't want to read something back into the Bible that's not there when covenant doesn't come up until Genesis 6. I know earlier I was saying that Christ uh, can be read back into Genesis 1, but that's because of how the Bible refers to Christ as the Word and the One through whom all things were made. Therefore, we're not reading him back into Genesis 1. The Bible is telling us that he was there. But the notion of a covenant of redemption and a covenant of works I don't think the Bible tells us that that's either pre-time or in uh, Genesis 2, either one of them. So we want to be careful that we're, uh, that we're not going too far to try to make things make sense in ways that actually raise more questions um, instead of just uh, reading the Bible like it's supposed to. Anyway, I hope, you know, you might, many of you might disagree with me on that. That's okay. Just, uh, just bear with me. But he repeats the covenantal idea. Um, later on, after the flood in Genesis 9, uh, when he says, uh, Genesis 9, 9, um, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and every living creature, uh, that I will never cut off the earth again, um, by, uh, never, never again will, will floodwaters destroy the earth, verse 11, and the sign is the rainbow, which is ironic because of the fact that we're in a gay pride month and the rainbow has been co-opted, um, as a sign, uh, for them. Uh, but little do they know that the rainbow is meant to be a sign that God won't judge the earth again uh, because of floodwaters. But in any event, despite man's exceeding wickedness, chapter 8, verse 21, which we talked about a few minutes ago, God is promising he's not going to destroy it, destroy the earth again. So the, this, is, this is a hint that redemption is coming, right? It's a hint that redemption is coming, salvation is coming. Well, by chapter 9, Noah, he's got his sons. They, uh, he divides the blessing between them after he, uh, the whole thing with him getting drunk and falling asleep naked and the sons covering him up and all that. Uh, just a pretty interesting story, but we're not going to deal with it too much. Um, then chapter 10 has, the, um, has the, uh, the, the list of nations descended from Noah. Uh, so divisions between the sons, descended from Noah's sons, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And all the nations that came from them. Uh, by the time you get to chapter 11 of Genesis is the Tower of Babel or Babel, uh, which is a very interesting story. Uh, but the people, there, it seems to be that there's a united people who try to build a tower that reaches to the heavens. Verse 3 of Genesis 11, let us make bricks, and burn them thoroughly, and let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And make a name for ourselves, lest we be dis uh, dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, God had said to go fill the earth, be fruitful, and multiply. But these people say we want to stop, and we want to build a tower uh, up to the heavens to make a name for ourselves. So, the idea is, um, you know, God tells Adam and Eve, don't eat that tree. Don't eat from that tree, I should say. And trust me. And uh, the serpent says, no, you know, don't trust him. He's lying to you. And then here, after he tells the people to be fruitful, fill the earth and multiply, 
uh, you know, spread out, they say, no, we're going to stop here and build a tower to the heavens. You know, spread out, trust me and come to know me. No, we're going to stop here and we're going to build a tower to the heavens to try to basically be like God. And that's basically the story of the Bible. That's the story of religion that says righteousness precedes grace. If I can just build a tower to the heavens, God will be uh, impressed with me. And uh, here we see that that's not, that doesn't impress God. Instead, he goes down there. Verse 7 of Genesis 11, come let us go down there and there confuse the language, perhaps a hint to the Trinity. I think that it is. And then eventually this leads to our genealogy all the way to Abraham. And, uh, and eventually we get ourselves into chapter 12 here where he calls Abraham when his name is still Abram. Uh, just chooses him, calls him out and says, come and follow me. And so it's clear here that there's a chosen people chosen to be under his grace while others are left to themselves. Uh, again, there's a holy line. And uh, without that holy line being there, there's not going to be salvation. There's not going to be redemption. That's why the gospel, two of the gospel accounts, especially Matthew, um, anchor Jesus' identity in his lineage. Luke, going all the way back to Adam, Matthew going back to Abraham because they want the gospel writers want us to understand where he comes from and want us to understand that he is the one who who was promised to bring about this uh, redemption. And just note here that once we get into chapters 11 and 12, 11 with Babel and 12 with the call of Abraham, right after man tries um, going after his own glory, building a tower to the heavens, um, and then God judges him for that. God then calls a man, Abram, telling him, come my way and I'll make you glorious. So they say in chapter 11, let's go our own way and, uh, and glorify ourselves. God judges them. And then he calls Abram and says, come my way and I will make your way glorious. Make your choice, right? You're going to go your own way and, um, and try to build a tower to the heavens, live your own life, and then end up confused and have it be a mess. Or are you going to follow God's call, go his way, and uh, let him lead you, guide you, and direct you? With that being said, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to pray, and uh, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll look at Abram, the call of Abram, a little bit more next week. So let's pray. So Father, today we thank you for your word, for your truth, and for your redemptive plan that has uh, culminated in Christ. And uh, it's in him that we live and move and have our being, and uh, your plan was so glorious, so beautiful, so wonderful. History belongs to you. Indeed, history is your story. And uh, may we play a small part in your advancement of your kingdom and uh, use the scriptures to that end. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Lord bless you. Talk to you soon.